Amen. So good to see you in the house of the Lord. Uh, I'm going to have you stand up again in just a minute, but go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> it's wonderful to be in God's house today and to worship the Lord and hear His Word. And We were praying just a few minutes ago in our prayer time, and I believe that every time we come together and the Word of God is taught, it's preached, that there is untold potential in the house because of the the living nature of God's Word. And I'm glad that we get to spend some time together looking at the Word and considering what God has to say to all of us. So glad to have the Odals back from Israel, fresh off of their trip. Uh, I imagine in the mornings they're doing well, but maybe afternoons are a little tough because of jet lag. But we're thankful they're back. I know Kimberly and Kevin uh, Buckberger were on that trip. Brian and Sophia Smith were on that trip. And so uh, this is the nap section right over here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Better keep it hot. Brother Odell used to tell me in college, he said, if people fall asleep while you're preaching, it's not their fault. I never will forget that. You got to keep fire in the pulpit. So, uh, but all kidding aside, we are thankful for these that have been traveling, uh, that are back, and we're just welcoming all of you to the house of the Lord today. Amen. Here's what I would like us to do. I'm going to teach this morning. I know Pastor Nate mentioned this last Sunday, and uh, I will teach today and then also next Sunday morning in our 930 session on the subject of discipleship. And I feel like this subject is so crucial to this church right now. It's an important subject nonetheless, but especially at the juncture in which we find ourselves as a church. And so we're just going to kind of do a deep dive today into the subject of discipleship. And I hope you brought your Bible or your smartphone or your tablet or something that you can look at the scriptures with us because we're going to try our very best to have a very Bible-based series the next couple of Sunday mornings. But to start off, I would like us to do a little bit of role-playing, and this will probably be the only time we'll do this in this session today. Uh, But in just a minute, here's what I'm going to have you do. So listen very closely if you would. In just a moment, I'm going to have you get in a group of two people. And I would rather, please listen, I would rather you not get with the person that maybe you're sitting right next to that you know well. And so if that's husband, wife, whatever the case may be. I know that that presses us a little bit and, and we're like, come on, pastor. We like the person we're sitting next to. We're comfortable with the person. But I have a purpose in mind for this, okay? So in just a moment, I'm going to have you get with somebody in just groups of two. Uh, So let's start with that. And and you don't have to even start talking to each other. You can just stare at each other if you want to. But I want us to stand together, and I want you to find one person and get with them, just physically get close to where they are. And then once you've done that, look up here so I know that you're ready to go on, all right? Look up here so I know you're ready to go on. Okay? Okay. Well, there's a whole lot of talking going on, but all right, all right. look up here when you're, when you're ready, and I'll know you're ready. Okay. So we have another brother Odal over here needs someone to join up with him. Anybody else needs somebody to connect with them? Hopefully somebody that you're not sitting right next to, but groups of two. All right, now I will let you go back to where you were seated in a minute, but why don't you just sit right where you're at with that person? Can we do that? Just sit, because we're going to need to talk to each other here for a minute. All right? Now we're going to have to use our imagination with this. Going to have to use our imagination. And here's how we're going to do this. We're just going to do a little role playing to start off. Here is the the understood thing about this little time. You don't know each other, okay? So the person, and you may say, no, I really don't know this person, but uh, that's good, that's good. Well, this will be even more effective. But in this scenario, you don't know each other, okay? So you don't know their name, you don't know anything about them. And so here's the goal. The goal is to find out a little bit in just a few moments, find out a little bit about their faith background. When I say that, what I mean is a walk with God, no walk with God. A church background, no church background. You're going to find out about their faith background. However, it cannot be the first thing you talk about with them, and it cannot be the second thing you talk about with them. Okay? Are you all clear so far? 
So the goal is to find out their faith background, something about their faith background. But it can't be the first thing you talk about. It can't be the second thing you talk about. Now, once you get past those two things, I'll let you decide how you do that, okay? So everybody clear on what we're needing here? So this may take, you know, 60 seconds or more, whatever. We won't take a whole long time. But, but I'm just going to let you connect, and you're going to find out a little bit about their faith background. It can't be the first thing or second thing you talk to. Ready? Go. <laughs> All right. Now, let me just interrupt. Those of you that are in a gab fest, let me just interrupt you right now. You have to understand, when we first started our church and we would turn to, to the congregation, I would turn to the congregation, I would say, take just a moment to greet those around you. You know, when you have six people, that goes real fast. That goes real fast. So this is actually energizing to me to hear this, this conversation and hear the, the, the roar, roar of people talking. Um, let, let me just have some feedback. You can't talk about faith background first or second. So what did you talk about? What, uh, Carolyn. I just feel like we went through a conversational whiplash right there. <laughs> Did you know that Lowe's sells more? You know what? And I'm being funny. That, that was a bridge right there. That was a, a conversation starter. Okay. So you got a conversation started about a very practical something. John. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Deer hunting. Well, that's appropriate with opening weekend of gun season. Very good. Uh, Ashley. We talked about our family, our kids, where we work, and where that goes to the work. Okay, there you go. Good. Good. Family, kids, where you work. Good. Celinda. So, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Kind of those bridges to that conversation. Somebody else, anything else that you talked about, those first or second subjects that you talked about? Where you grew up. Where you grew up, okay. Uh, did any of you actually introduce yourself to that person and tell them what your name was? That always helps <laughs> if you share a name. <laughs> that way you don't get through a whole conversation and say, well, it was nice to meet you, stranger, you know? Okay. So here's what I want us to do. With that in mind, I want us to take our Bible. I want us to go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. And it will be our text for this session today. Matthew, chapter 28. And we'll begin reading at verse number 16. While you're turning there, uh, without just over-exaggerating uh, my remarks. And by the way, you can go back. If you would prefer to go back to where you were seated, you can. Uh, you can leave your friend, your new friend, and go back to where you were seated. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> I got to spend a couple of days with some of our leaders from our church this week, and we were discussing this whole idea of discipleship, and I really feel like that this subject is the key uh, to our continued growth in this facility and our growth once we get in our new facility. And so uh, I, I think there is an attractional something that happens when a church literally builds a new building. But I will tell you this, lasting growth and permanent growth in a church does not come through a facility. It comes through a process of discipleship. And so this is why I wanted to take some time in November and kind of drill down on this subject and then we'll be obviously sharing a whole lot more about this in the, in, in the year that is ahead of us. Um, Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 16, the last few verses of the Gospel of Matthew. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee. Everyone say the disciples. They went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Jesus has said, go to this mountain. I'm going to minister to you before I ascend. So they're there. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority, the King James Version says, All power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Say it with me. Make disciples. Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. These are the final words that Jesus is sharing with his followers. It's the great commission. It's the challenge of what to do after he is off the scene. When there is no more physical Jesus Christ, what are they supposed to do when they come down off of the mountain? And it stands as a pivotal statement in Jesus' day, but even more so in our day today. When we talk about the word discipleship, we, it really is broken down into two different, uh, not words, one is a word and the other is a suffix, but it's the word disciple and then the suffix ship, discipleship. When the suffix ship is added to a word, it indicates a state or condition. And so a disciple is a follower. So discipleship is the state of making followers, the state of making followers. Let me give you another definition, and perhaps we'll put this on the screen and it'll make some sense. Discipleship defined is the intentional practice of making or raising up followers of Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. Discipleship defined in our context, in the church context, is the intentional practice. Everyone say the intentional practice. The intentional practice of making or raising up followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I will tell you, and, and some of you have been in the church or in the way. Uh, remember that old song, I'm in the way, the bright and shining way? We've been in the church a long time, and so what I have found over the years is there is a tendency, if we're not careful, to really misunderstand discipleship. So let me just kind of tell you what I believe discipleship is not. Discipleship is not the incessant drumbeat of inviting people to your church. That's not discipleship. Now, is that a part of the disciple-making process, them coming to a local church? Yes, we'll talk more about that. That's not really discipleship, though. Discipleship is not inviting your neighborhood kids to come to a candy rain because you're going to throw candy off the, the church ceiling or roof. That, that, that's not discipleship. Uh, discipleship is not you and I greeting one another in a service and slapping each other on the back and saying, great to see you. Actually, that's not fellowship or discipleship. That's just greeting each other, okay? But most of discipleship happens outside of this building. Most of discipleship happens outside of this building because it is an intentional practice of making people and raising up people who follow Jesus Christ. And so it is in this context of these verses that really we see the success of what making a disciple is. And it's actually right in the scripture. So let's look at the Bible and let the Bible interpret for us what a success is in the disciple making process. Look at it in Matthew 28 and verse number 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Here we go. This is the success. This is when you know it's a success. Baptizing them. Everyone say baptizing them. This speaks of the salvation of their soul. So we're not interested in just making followers who are not converted. Jesus said, go and make disciples, and here's what it means, to baptize them. We understand that uh, salvation is comprised of two baptisms, a water baptism in the name of Jesus and a spirit baptism. So baptism, or the salvation component, shows the success of a disciple-making process. However, that's not where it stops. The next part says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So Jesus says making disciples is baptism, that's salvation. And number two, it's teaching people to observe all the things that I have said to you. That is spiritual growth. So discipleship is the planting of the seed, the coming up of the fruit, 
but then the continued fruitfulness in somebody's life. This is why when we talk about discipleship on a Sunday morning, we've got to be in it for the long haul, not just for the altar experience. So let me just say it like this, and I'll be real clear. Someone coming and being water baptized in the name of Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking with other tongues, that's just the beginning of discipleship. I can't, as a disciple maker, say, well, they got the Holy Ghost, they were baptized, my work is done. No, that's just the delivery room. That's just the start, according to Scripture. Now, as a friend with intention, I am encouraging them through my example to observe all the things that the Lord has taught to me. But I want you to notice this. It's so interesting to me, and the more I have dug into this over the last little while, the more enlightenment has come in my spirit. Jesus didn't say, teach them to observe all the things that I've shown them. He said, teach them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. So there is this intentional showing of our life to other people that begins to make disciples. Now, I will tell you this. That is Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 19 and the Lord uh, and, and 20. And the Lord goes on to say, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. As long as this age is going on, I'm going to be with you. But I also want to tell you that I believe there's a third step to the success of discipleship, and that is this. When a disciple reproduces themselves and makes another disciple. Okay? So if I am trying to disciple Joe rough, and he is born again. That's the baptism part, the salvation part. And then I, through my experience and the things that we'll talk about today and how to make a disciple, I teach him and I model for him and I show him what the Lord has commanded me. And he begins to embrace that and grow in his walk with God. And then Joe begins to make a disciple. That's the real success of discipleship, when there is this reproduction that happens. And I will say this, that's going to be the permanent essence of growth in this church. That's how we're going to fill up that building and any other building that we have on a Sunday morning, is through the reproduction, disciples making disciples, followers of Jesus making other followers of Jesus. I like it when it was said like this, reproducing other disciples is often the missing piece of disciple making. Genuine disciple making has happened when other disciples have been multiplied. The truth is, I want all of us to have grandkids and great-grandkids. You say, well, with Gaddy, I'm 20 years old. It's a little tough. No, I'm not talking about I want you to have physical grandkids, but I want us to have spiritual grandkids. I want you to make a disciple and me to make a disciple, and John, that person makes a disciple, and I'm Grandpa Tim. And then that person makes disciples, and now I'm a great-grandfather. I want us to, to, to see this disciple-making process spring forth in our church like never before. The going and the making of disciples is really a lifelong process. So, if my goal in living for God as a born-again believer is to raise up other people that follow Jesus Christ, then as a disciple maker, and I'm going to make some distinctions here, I'm going to talk about disciple makers and disciples themselves. As a disciple maker, if I'm raising up people and desiring to raise up people to follow Jesus, then I must do two things, and I want you to see this. Number one, I have to get to know Jesus. Okay? Number one, I need to get to know Jesus Christ. Because if I am intentionally training someone or raising someone up to follow Jesus, I have to know him myself. I have to know who he was. I have to know how he thought, and I must know what he did. If I'm going to tell someone, hey, here's what the Lord's dealing with me about, and Jesus is the guide for my life, I need to know him. So, so I want to say that the homework that you and I can have coming out of this session today is to read the Gospels. Look at someone and say, read the Gospels. 
In fact, I'm just going to give you that as your homework. You know, we're, we're, what, 10 minutes into this, and I'm already giving homework. Read the Gospels this week and next week. And we're going to find out who Jesus was. You say, I know who Jesus was. He was a man from Galilee. He walked dusty shores, all that stuff. He was a miracle worker. But who was he? What did he do? What did he think? Who was he in, in, in his practice, in his, his lifestyle? What got, gave him joy and what gave him, uh, what made him mad? There were some things, by the way, when Jesus walks into the temple and cleanses the temple, he wasn't just a little bit perturbed. He was angry. Well, you know what? I need to find out what makes him angry because I don't want to do that. Again, we're trying our best to get to know Jesus. That's number one. But as a disciple maker, I can't just know Jesus. But number two, I have to build intentional relationships with potential followers of Jesus Christ. Build intentional relationships with potential followers of Jesus Christ. I like what Phil Stevenson said, and I quote, People are discipled in relationship, not in the transference of knowledge or content. That's so good, I'm going to say that again. People are discipled in relationship, not in the transference of knowledge or content. Listen, we're not just trying to get people's doctrine right. We're trying to help people to understand there's a better way to live, and that's by following Jesus Christ. Amen. We're not, this is not a, a, a debate about doctrine. That, that's not what our, our goal is. Our goal is not to out-doctrine somebody else. Uh, I, I've used this example before. It's uh, Saturday morning. It's about 10, 15. You're up, you slept in. You're, you're, you're having your blueberry pancakes on Saturday morning, and you've just taken your first bite, and there's a knock at the door. And we, we all do this. We say, I wonder who that must be. It, it, that's always interesting to me that we, may, we say that. We don't have any idea who it is at the door. But nowadays, hardly anybody knocks on the door anymore. You ever notice that? There are very few people come over. Like, I, I guess that used to be a normal thing back in the day. But there's a knock on your door. You go to the door and you open it and you're, you're thinking it's going to be someone selling you a magazine or someone wanting to treat your lawn or something like that. But there's a couple of guys there and they've got little badges on and white shirts, starch shirts and black trousers, and, and, it, it, and it's some faith group that is wanting to talk. Do you know why most people, hopefully nicely, just say no thanks and close the door and go back to eating their blueberry pancakes? Um, it, it's because most of the time those endeavors are wanting to talk doctrine with someone that they don't know. Okay, So I'm going to make a statement that may sound a little bit strange at first, but when it comes to disciple making, people aren't nearly as uh, enamored by our doctrine as we are. Oh, but we got the truth, Brother Gaddy. I know that. But they're not nearly as enamored by the, our doctrine as we are. And I'll, I'll make another statement, and this is off the Tim Gaddy page here. They aren't nearly as afraid of our doctrine as you might think they are. They want to know, do I have a friend that's staring at me right now? That's right. Because the bridge between where they believe and where the truth of the Scripture is sometimes is a very small bridge, but it has to be bridged by relationship. Right. This cannot be just a cramming of, of doctrine. and just Here's the thing. I believe we got the truth, folks. I believe that this church stands for the truth of the Word of God. We believe it. We stand upon it. We preach it. We teach it but it's only disseminated in people's lives effectively through relationship. Right. Amen. And so this is why the potential sitting in this room right now is staggering. Because if we really understand the truth and then we build relationships, powerful things can happen. So there has to be intention with these relationships. has to be intention. Um, so here's the question that I'm asking myself, and I want to challenge all of us. What am I doing intentionally to make a disciple. What am I doing intentionally to make a disciple? Now, here's what I want us to understand. When I ask that question of myself, I'm not saying 
what am I doing in the normal course of life to make a disciple? Now, it needs to become a normal thing that we do to look for other disciples to make. But I'm talking about intentionally making disciples. So let me just kind of bring it down where the rubber meets the pavement. Who have I not had over for a meal at my house? But I feel a connection with them, and I feel like this may be an open door to making a disciple. That's an intentional thing. When you cook a meal and have someone over, most of the time that's not an accident. You don't just cook a little extra and open the front door and say, hey, anybody want to come over for dinner? But what am I intentionally doing in my life for the purpose of making a disciple? Let's look in our Bibles at Luke chapter number 5. Would you turn there, please? Luke chapter number 5. Luke 5 and verse 27, Jesus has healed a paralyzed man, a very dramatic scene in a house. The house was full. They ripped up the roof, put him down through. Jesus healed the paralyzed man. After these things, those things, the healing, he, Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he, Jesus, said to him, Levi, what did he say? Follow me. Say that. Follow me. So he, look at verse number 28. This is a huge verse. So he left all. He rose up and he followed him. 29. Then Levi, Luke 5 and 29. Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now let me stop, and this is not going to be the main part of what I teach here today. But can I just tell you, beginning at verse number 30 down through 32, identifies for us one of the spirits that will be alive and well when a disciple-making culture is active in a church. There will always be people that don't understand that. Okay, so I'm not going to belabor this, but there will always be, from time to time, pharisaical spirits that try to diminish the need that the church has in connecting with unbelievers. Okay? This was in Jesus' day. This happens in our day today. This is why Jesus said, you guys don't have a clue. You don't have a clue. The people that I'm called to are the ones that are sick. Well, people have no need of a physician. People are not lining up at the Cabot Medical Clinic or the New Cabot Hospital because they're well. They're lining up because they're sick. And Jesus said, that's who I'm called to. And so that's a spirit, we have to understand that, and we can't be deterred by that. But it is in this passage that we see some very powerful things portrayed. And it's this, there is an effect of discipleship. And so the question can be asked, how do I know if I'm growing in discipleship personally? And how do I know if the person I'm making as a disciple is growing? If this is our goal, to grow them and to grow spiritual growth in their life, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, how do we know that's happening? Number one, it's found right here in Luke chapter 5 and verse number 28. Things are left behind, first of all. The Bible says that Levi left all. That's in the 28th verse there. Levi left all. That means there's priorities that start changing. How many of you have lived for the Lord long enough, followed Him long enough to know that when you're converted and you really start to follow Jesus Christ, your priorities change? You leave behind some things that used to be very dear. And Levi left some things behind. Number two, he rose up. His posture changed. His actions change. If I'm a true disciple of Jesus I start doing things differently. My posture changes. I get up from where I was and I'm going toward a new place. This is the mark of a true disciple. A true disciple is not somebody that just shows up at church, but a true disciple is someone that has some things that they've left behind. Priorities have changed. And now there's some different posture. There's some different things that we're doing. Actions change. And thirdly, 
the Bible says, Levi followed Jesus. So the leadership of my life changes. If, if a person is truly being a disciple of Jesus Christ, the focus is no longer primarily on me, but it's on Jesus Christ. And when the focus is off of me, I don't call the shots anymore. I let his word guide me. I let his spirit guide me. Levi followed him. So I want to make sure we get this. Do we have that on the screen? Yeah. How do I know if I'm growing in discipleship? Number one, let's go back to that first one. How do I know I'm growing in discipleship? Number one, things are left behind. Priorities change. Number two, posture changes. Actions change. And number three, the leadership of my life changes. The focus is no longer primarily upon me. Is that making sense to somebody? And the reason why I share this is because there is a room full of people that are potential disciple makers in this room. And when you start intentionally investing in people's lives and they start growing, you're, you and I are going to see these things happen in their lives. And it's going to give us an indication. It's working. There's growth happening here. And, and so I think it's important to use the word to define these things. And now let's also make sure we understand how Jesus called his disciples. Because if we want to be disciples and disciple makers, we have to look at the, the one that initially called. Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 18. Would you turn there in your Bible, please? Matthew chapter 4. Everybody doing okay this morning? You understanding what I'm teaching so far? Yes? Okay. <laughs> if the overwhelming answer is, huh, then we need to go back, all right? Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them. And by the way, the inference here is he said the same thing to them that he said to Simon Peter and, and Andrew, follow me. He called them. And immediately they left the boat, watch this, and their father, and followed him. Remember, the mark of a true disciple is there are some things that are left behind. So I want to say this. I won't, won't belabor this. There's some relationships that have to be left behind if I'm truly going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. There's some actions that have to change if I'm truly going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So they followed him. Now, please note this. Jesus intentionally went where fishermen were. To make disciples, he didn't call them from the synagogue. Hey, Peter. Andrew, come over here and follow me. No, Jesus actually went to where they were. He got intentionally on their turf in their life. But Jesus' call to them to follow him was in the ordinary coming and going of life. But it was intentional. Now notice what Jesus called to them. He simply said this, Follow me. Follow me. Now, when I was putting just the finishing touches on this lesson today, the Lord just settled in my spirit about this. What I'm finding about human nature, especially in disciple making, and I'm trying to live it out like you are, it is a whole lot easier to look at someone that I'm trying to make as a disciple and say, hey, you, you need to follow him than it is to say to that person, follow me. But Jesus' call was follow me. So here's where I want to get. I need, I'm working hard at this, and I want to get better. I want to live my life in such a way that I am unafraid to say to someone, follow me. Are you, are you with me? I'm not saying that arrogantly. I'm not saying that egotistically. I'm not saying that like, hey, look at me at the expense of not looking at Jesus. But what did Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. 
as though God was saying through us, be reconciled to God. We are the representation of Jesus Christ on this earth. So I want to live my life in such a way that if I was to say to Frank, who is a man that I'm trying to make as a disciple, hey, Frank, follow me, that it wouldn't be such that there would be a disconnect between what he sees in me and what Jesus Christ is all about. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hey, folks, listen, we don't need to shy away from that. It puts the responsibility on us to be a born-again believer in practice and in conversion. But I want people to follow my example because we're the only Jesus in skin they see. That's good preaching, Brother Gaddy. Amen. Jesus' call is to follow me. I pray that over the next few months in this city that you and I will have a, a baptism in our spirit that says, hey, to disciple makers, follow, follow my example. If you want to follow after Jesus, fo do what I do. Follow my example. I'm, I'm, I say that humbly. I'm trying my best to serve the Lord, but may God help us to be his representation on the earth. Now let's look at another passage, Luke chapter number 5, Luke 5. And I'm going to stop in just a minute after this uh, point, and then I'll continue next week. Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 1, and it gives us a little expanded view of what Matthew talked about in Matthew chapter 4. So it was, verse 1, Luke 5, so it was as the multitude pressed him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. I want you to notice a couple of things from this passage. And again, the reason why we're, we're going through this is because this is when Jesus called people. So we see the, 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 the model for us. Jesus got into one of their boats. He didn't say, hey, you're going to be fishers of men, but you've got to come where I am. He got into one of their boats. And secondly, he performed a miraculous in their midst. Now, there's nothing that will really bind together a disciple-making process like a miracle. When someone that you're discipling sees a miracle done in their midst, it can be very, very powerful. But I also want to tell you this, miracles and, and those kind of things that happen can cause a whole lot of reactions in people. Here's what... Simon Peter said when the miracle happened, Jesus said, throw your nets on this side. They said, well, you know, and, and what's interesting in this passage is uh, he's saying this. Jesus, the carpenter's son, is saying this to people who fished for a living. And there's nothing that people like, dislike more than someone telling them how to do their own job. Can, I mean, can, really, can you see this? Jesus hops up in one of their boats and says, hey, professional fishermen, I have an idea how you can catch more fish. If I'm the professional fisherman, I'm saying, go build something. <laughs> I'm the fisherman. But Simon Peter said, Master, so he understands a little bit about this man named Jesus. We've toiled all night long. They're just not biting. James, they're just not biting today. But I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to give your word a shot. They threw their nets on the other side and such a great number of fish were caught. They had to call their partners in. They loaded up the boats. They started to sink. And that miracle produced a reaction in this potential disciple. He said, I'm a sinful man. Because when a disciple, a potential disciple gets in the presence of a miracle, 
It has a way of showing them how undone they are. And notice what Jesus did, though, when, when P- Simon Peter said, I'm a sinful man, depart from me. It was Jesus that said to him, don't fear, don't fear. In other words, don't look at where you are and where you perceive me to be and let that keep you from coming close to me. Fear not, for I will make you fishers of men. In other words, I'm going to make you something in just the way you are right now. You know what's cool about this? They still fished. They just changed what they were fishing for. And and what's so awesome about making disciples is however that person is wired, God wants to use them in that personality to impact his kingdom. Amen? So if you're making a disciple and they are a very gregarious, outgoing, never meet a stranger kind of person, they have tremendous potential to be used with that kind of personality in the kingdom of God. Now, they may live like the devil himself right now, but conversion changes people's lives. Amen. You never know who you're discipling. And I'll finish with this. Acts chapter 18, the Bible says that Crispus was ministered to by the Apostle Paul in Athens. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He was a a religious leader. And the Bible says in Acts 18 and 8, many of the Corinthians, when they heard of Crispus' conversion, believed and were baptized. Now, notice, I didn't say when Crispus was, uh, was converted, many people ran to the synagogue and heard Paul preach. Bible says when Crispus was converted, many people heard about his conversion and believed Jesus because of Crispus' conversion and came to the truth because of his conversion. There are people that we are going to disciple in this next few months that only God himself knows the impact they're going to have in this city. There are people that we're going to raise up as disciples through our disciple-making process who have influence beyond what you and I have. Acts chapter 18 later on, verse 26 and verse 27, Apollos, a man who the Bible says was mighty in the scriptures, but only knew the baptism of John. Aquila and Priscilla took him to the side and showed him the way of God more clearly. They gave him credit for where he was, but they showed him the way of God more clearly. And the Bible says, verse 27, that Apollos greatly helped those who had believed through grace. So I just want to throw this out here and say to all the disciple makers here, you never know who it is you're discipling. They could be a wonderful tool in the hand of the Lord. I want us to stand together. Amen. Amen. Pray with me right now. I want this to be a part of the DNA of this church, this whole disciple-making process. Lord, I thank you for every single person that sits under the sound of my voice right now. I thank you for so many who have been born again of water and spirit, Lord, and you have saved us with such a higher purpose than merely existing in your kingdom, Lord. But you are challenging us and calling us, Lord, to make disciples. Lord, to intentionally begin relationships with people with the intention of drawing them close to you, God, and reproducing what you've done in our lives, in their lives, and then them making disciples, Lord. I pray, I'm asking today, humbly, Lord, that you would let this become the DNA of our church, Lord. I pray that you would let a revival of long-term discipleship rest upon many people in this room, God. Let it grip our hearts. Let it be something that is a part of who we are every single day, Lord. I pray we will push past the fear and we will push past any hindrance, Lord, and you will help us to follow your pattern in Scripture to see them saved and then walking in the truth that you've shown us, Lord. Help us to live out the Great Commission. And I thank you for that, and I give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen.